Hi, everyone. My name is Peter Caldas. I'm the CEO of the American Society on Aging, and I want to welcome you again to this episode of Future Proof. For those ASA members who are joining us, welcome. Thank you for your membership. If you're not an ASA member, we hope you join us and you'll get access to content like this. I'm delighted today to be joined by uh, a longstanding ASA member who also happens to be a pretty important member to us here at ASA. Uh, Michael Adams is the chairman of the ASA board and his day job is being CEO of SAGE. Michael, welcome to Future Proof. Thank you, it's uh, really my pleasure to be here. So Michael, when we chatted about you doing Future Proof, uh, originally we talked about wanting to learn about SAGE's response to COVID and how you innovated. And we may have time for that, but it strikes me given what's going on today uh, that we pivot a little bit and talk a little bit about racism, talk a little bit about uh, racial equity specifically, and really do it through an older adult and LGBTQ lens. And I hope you're okay with that today. Um, great with it, great with it, absolutely, yeah. So SAGE is headquartered in New York, and I'm wondering if you could share with us um, what's happening on the streets of New York these last few weeks and you know how how it's impacted SAGE's work? Well, I, I, you know, we have, like many cities across the country, we have had continuous massive demonstrations in protest to the recent series of racist killings and attacks against Black Americans. Um, we had um, some violence early on that fortunately subsided. And um, the, the scenes on the street and the energy on the street has really been very dramatic. I, I would say even more so given that we're emerging from several months of everybody staying inside, you know, and being shut down given that New York City is, uh, has been an epicenter and a hotspot um, for the, um, you know, for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think that the impact is 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 huge, um, huge in terms of policy already in New York City. Already we've had um, our uh, mayor um, uh, take a series of new positions with regard to policing. We have just had the New York State Legislature take some very important steps in terms of reforming police practices. And for SAGE in particular, it's also been very important. Um, we have been involved in a multi-year diversity and equity initiative at SAGE since 2014. And that um, because of systemic racism, that initiative has um, really focused substantially around racial equity. But I think what the protests have done is really underline the urgency of now. Um, that the the importance of making change now, of not waiting any longer, and it has really underlined the importance of centering Black lives um, in you know in that work, the fundamental need for that, the recognition that more than 150 years after the abolition of slavery, sadly in this country, it's still disputed terrain that Black lives matter and that we have to change that and therefore center that center that focus. So I would say it's been, a, it's been uh, these aren't new issues for SAGE, just like they're not new issues for our country, um, but it has raised the bar in terms of, of moving now to make the changes that need to be made. You know, Michael, the kinds of protests that we're seeing on the streets, they're, they're sustained and they're really uh, driving change. We're seeing that in cities like New York and elsewhere. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the history of protest movements, particularly in the LGBT space, uh, or with black elders as well. I mean, June is Pride Month, so I'm wondering if you could shed a little, his give us a little history lesson on that. Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's a great question, and, and, and it's a great question this month because people sometimes forget that the Stonewall Uprising, which is generally recognized as the birth of the modern day LGBT movement, that the Stonewall Uprising was an uprising against police violence uh, and police harassment and police lawlessness. And the Stonewall Uprising was led um, by transgender and gender nonconforming people of color. Um, so this is the roots of, uh, of, of our movement, of our community and the, you know, um, the community that SAGE works on behalf of. 
it's as as the country's um, organization focused on LGBTQ elders, um, we we remind people that those mostly young people who led the Stonewall uprising um, 51 years ago, there are elders now, right? Um, the, the, they are the, they are the elder pioneers in our community, and we know at Sage. Um, that many of the elders that we worked with were not just activists for um, liberation and equality for LGBTQ people. They were also activists for racial equality. And the, in the, you know, they were among the, you know, um, among the Freedom Riders in the 1960s in the South and civil rights activists who were, you know, marching once again um, in the face of police oppression and violence in the 1950s and 1960s. And so what's happening now really to me feels very much like a continuation of our history and specifically the history that we celebrate this month that as LGBTQ people, we celebrate, you know, in June in the month of pride. You know, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was COVID, but it strikes me that the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color seems to just be highlighted by this conversation, this important conversation we're having about racial equity. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit um, those details around those health disparities and what you've seen. Yeah, I mean, the health disparities, I, I mean, I would say they're shocking and the numbers are shocking, but the reality is none of us should be shocked because they just reflect the systemic racism that exists in this country and how that manifests when it comes to health. In New York City, um, um, the death rate among black people with COVID-19 is twice as high as it is among white people. In the state of Michigan, 14% of the population of the state of Michigan is black, but 40%, 40% of the um, people who are dying from COVID-19 are black, right? So that's almost that's almost triple the um, the death rate. And as as dramatic as these statistics are, they shouldn't surprise us because the reality is in this country, and we know this with Sage among our elders, is that um, Black Americans are much more likely to age in poverty. They're much more likely to live in in dense, overly populated areas that uh, where there is not as easy access to medical facilities and medical care, they're much more likely to live in um, in um, neighborhoods that are food deserts or where it's hard to get access to food. And we all know that 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 nutrition is one of the key social determinants of health, right? So when you when you connect these dots, it shouldn't be surprising to us. Um, that these statistics are as are as stark as they are, but I completely agree with you. They really they really underline that what's at stake here and and what has to be changed here. It's not just about it's not just about racism and policing. That that is what has triggered um, the current protests. But it's a whole system. It's a whole system of racism. Um, against Black Americans, that leads to much worse health, much worse health comes, health outcomes, um, to you know serious challenges with regard to a higher death rates and a whole range of issues that that as aging service providers and as aging advocates, I think those need to be our priorities. Um, you know, we we are here to, to to serve and support and advocate for for older Americans. And I think what's happening now is shining a very strong spotlight on the fact that much more needs to be done when it comes for advocating and serving uh, older black Americans. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that intersection uh, between race and age. Uh, you, you, you laid it out nicely in, in the context of health disparities. I'm wondering if there are other examples where the intersection of age and race plays such an important role here. Well, one that immediately um, comes to mind is housing uh, and an equitable access to affordable housing. Um, you know, here again, uh, we know that Black Americans have historically and to this day um, continued to be 
um, very negatively impacted by redlining um, and by uh, racial segregation. Obviously, poverty and higher rates of poverty makes uh, access to housing and affordable housing um, that much more difficult. I would say as well, um, equitable access to culturally appropriate elder services. Um, you know, SAGE is proud to be a partner of the National Caucus on Black Aging, um, led by former ASA Chair uh, Karen Jones. Um, NCBA and SAGE are partners in the Diverse Elders Coalition. And, and one part of our common language and common lexicon is the, is the denial of equitable access to services. For, um, for older members of our communities. And, you know, how these, the specifics of how these things play out um, in different communities vary, but the overarching themes of, of a lack of equitable access to services is really important. And one more thing I would add, Peter, of course, is that, is that um, these are not mutually exclusive communities. You know, we have many LGBTQ older people who are black, um, just as we have many LGBTQ older folks who are AAPI and Latino. And so that intersectionality exists as well. We are, we are not in silos in terms of our, of our identities and our life experiences. So let's touch a little bit on, on COVID since we have a little time here and I'm getting some questions from the audience related to some of the services that you were delivering during this time. Uh, how did you think back to sort of the peak of the pandemic in New York. And for, me, for you, it started a little bit earlier than the rest of the country. I'm wondering how did you um, adjust your service delivery and, and to, to be more resilient in, in delivering the services that you're known for at Sage? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I'm really glad we have the opportunity to talk about that. And I think for all of us who are in the aging sector, depending on what part of the country we're in, those, the, those days in early March, mid-March, April, were some really, really challenging days in terms of not only the public health crisis, but how to, how to pivot and change our services. What, what we were dealing with in New York City by mid-March is that we run a network of five SAGE centers across the city um, that uh, you know, serve upwards of 3,000 LGBTQ older folks who are facing very severe social isolation. Often we're the only provider that, that our folks feel comfortable in accessing. And within the course of a couple of days, we had to make the decision. In fact, we were required by New York City to close those centers down. So all of a sudden, all of our congregate programs that are typically available to thousands of older LGBT folks in New York City were gone. Our congregate meal programs all of a sudden were gone and our folks were home, you know, basically completely, um, completely isolated. So we had to pivot really quickly. One of the ways that we pivoted is that we stood up first in New York City and eventually nationally an emergency telephonic support system um, where um, we are still um, you know, calling uh, 3,000 LGBTQ older folks uh, a week, making sure that once or twice a week, they hear a human voice. They hear from somebody who cares about them and, and wants to know what they're, if they're doing okay and if they're not doing okay, what they need. So we started, we started there. We since have expanded that program into a national telephonic support program called Sage Connect. And I have to say, one of the things that's been so heartening is to see the outpouring of volunteers for that Sage Connect program. We have more than 1,500 volunteers from across the country who are signing up for that program. I mean, we're, we're, we're running to try to keep up and make the matches fast enough, you know? So that's one piece. The second piece is virtual programming. Um, and this is one of the ways in which technology makes so much more possible. So. Um, we, um, you know, in, in the years leading up to COVID-19, we were struggling at SAGE with could we do virtual programming and how would it work and do we know how to make the technology work and would people come? And with COVID-19, it was like that. We have to figure out how to do it. We have to figure it out immediately. Um, and, and, and it turns out that people will absolutely come. So, so we are now uh, running, I think this week it is 95 um, virtual programs in New York City, everything under the sun, um, health and wellness classes, acting, painting, exercise, Spanish 101, everything you can imagine. 
And people are coming on in droves to participate in these programs. And the interesting thing is, I think we're reaching more people, including people who we wouldn't have reached otherwise, because they they, they wouldn't have been able, for one reason or another, to walk into our Sage centers, our and our Sage affiliates across the country. We have Sage affiliates in uh, in 30 cities across the country are doing the are doing the same thing. So the virtual programming, I think, is a new frontier. And I, I feel like it's just the beginning. Now that we know we can do it, and now that we know people will come, uh, there's so much more. Having said that, I mean, there are some real challenges there. And taking us back to the racial equity issue, there is a, div a digital divide in this country. And it's not just the fact that, that older people are less likely to be online than people of other ages. Um, Low-income people, people of color, are less likely to be online because often they don't have the equipment, the the access to internet. So from an advocacy perspective, we have to work to change that. But I think from a services perspective, it means that virtual programming can never replace um, you know, site-based in-person programming, but it's a really important tool right now. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that divide because it also includes a divide between rural and urban. And yes. I'm wondering, you must, using your affiliates, you must have recruited tons of volunteers. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your volunteerism during this time and how Sage has managed that. We know many of our members rely on volunteers to deliver some important community services. And, you know, understandably, they had a bit of a tough time during the pandemic. But I'm wondering, yeah. how did you manage that? Yeah, well, it's been it's been both, as I mentioned, really inspiring to see the tremendous outturning of volunteers, and also complicated. Um, we are accustomed at Sage to working with volunteers on site, meeting in person with volunteers, doing in person trainings, really having the opportunity to know our volunteers and match them up um, to the kinds of activities that will suit their interests and what they'll be good at. It's a whole different ball game when you're recruiting and engaging volunteers online. And so trying to, we've had to spend some time to figure out if we're talking about matching, for example, volunteers with folks who are gonna be getting um, telephone calls once a week. How do we do that responsibly? Right? Like how do we tap into that volunteer energy, but make sure that we're not creating bad experiences you know, for our constituents? So that's some of what we're working through now where um, we're building some new partnerships to figure out how to make that possible, but it's happening. You know, it's a it's a brave new world there when it comes to um, being able to engage much larger numbers of volunteers and and doing it everywhere. And I'm glad you mentioned the um, you know the kind of rural urban divide because that's a big preoccupation for us at at Sage. Um, a couple of years ago, AARP did a study that demonstrated. That 29% of LGBTQ older adults live in rural areas, um, and and nine out of ten of that 29% report that they have zero access to any form of LGBTQ welcoming senior services. So assuming that they have any kind of services that they can access in their area, they essentially have to recloset themselves in order to take advantage of those services. Um, that 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 sits with us. It's a it's 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 something that we have to change, and we've really struggled to figure out how to do that. But now we're starting to see that virtual programming can be at least one means of starting to address that reality. You know, Michael, this uh, conversation around technology and access has sparked a lot of uh, questions online from the audience. So I'm wondering if you would have any advice on how you would actually get to some of these more remote seniors or isolated seniors or what tactics perhaps Sage used to convince seniors who otherwise wouldn't be able to maybe um, rely on a friend or go to a library or somehow else to connect to the internet? What kind of yeah. tips would you have there? It's a huge, it's a huge issue. And, and, and I have to say, and, and Peter, you know this because we know each other. Um, I, I am not on the cutting age edge of like, you know, tech and tech strategies myself, but you know, my organization Sage is, uh, is getting there, which is really great. Historically at Sage, you know, long before COVID-19, um, we've had an emphasis on um, online education and computer literacy and have run classes and workshops on that topic for, um, you know, for years. And so 
the the accumulated result of that means that more of our folks were able to um, join in in this virtual programming that would otherwise be the case. But that's not true of everybody. So we've used a whole series of strategies. We have had both volunteers and um, some of our staff do, you know, get on the phone with people, you know, one-on-one -on -one folks who have a, you know, have a laptop but don't really know how to use it or don't know how to get online, you know, in the same way that, AS, that ASA staff was on the phone with me before this webinar, making sure I could like make this work and be on with you. That's what our, you know, that's what our, our, our staff and our volunteers are doing with, um, you know, are doing with older people when the issue is, you know, when the issue is I've got the equipment, but I don't know how to use it. You know, I've got the internet access, but I don't know how to get into it. There is, the, there is also the very large challenge of people that, that don't have, like that, that don't have internet access or don't have the equipment. And, and that's a hard nut to crack. And in, in, in New York City, we are working with and pushing the city um, to expand its program to make iPads available in, in low-income communities and people of color communities um, that the city has a big initiative underway in response to COVID-19, but it needs to get bigger. And as an advocacy organization, as well as services organization, we're pushing on that front. And I would say that that part of the solution is going to be advocacy. W what I understand now in a way I did not understand before COVID-19 um, is, that, is that online access, um, you know, rural broadband, these need to be um, advocacy issues for an organization like SAGE. I didn't get that actually before this, and now I do. And so it's really, I think, opening up our horizon as to what we have to be advocating for, because if we're not part of that coalition, our people will be left behind. You know, Michael, let's talk a little bit about advocacy, because that is the sort of the other side of the work that you do at SAGE. You know, in this time, there are so many issues that we should be advocating for. And I'm wondering, let's start at the basics. What tips would you give ASA members on how to successfully advocate for whatever issue they deem important for their community? Well, I think uh, I, I start with a couple of places. One is we, you know, so many of us who are members of ASA, we, are, we have the privilege of working very closely with older Americans in our communities across this country. Um, and there's so much opportunity to learn from the people we work with about what is most important and 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 what should we be fighting for and how should we set our agenda just to take an example for you know for us at sage um, what we have learned by talking to the constituents that we and our affiliates serve across the country that one is that one of the most fundamental challenges is the inability in many parts of the country to access services that are welcoming to them as lgbtq people and that, and that so a key part of our advocacy agenda has to be responding to that reality. That's why for our organization, we have focused intently um, on how those services get delivered and funded, starting at the federal level through the Older Americans Act. It's why not just, re, not just reauthorizing the Older Americans Act and putting more money into it, but putting in provisions that will um, support AAAs and, and, and encourage and actually require AAAs to focus on marginalized communities like the LGBT community is, you know, is so important. So I guess where I would say start there, like, like let's start by talking with our constituents about what they need and what's most important to them in their daily lives. And then let's use that knowledge to translate that um, into an advocacy agenda that we work tirelessly, tirelessly for. That's a that's a terrific uh, set of set of tips, actually, Michael. I think another set that we've increasingly been hearing from our membership is this idea that non traditional partners uh, are going to be very helpful here. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about partnerships and alliances in your work. Yeah, partnerships and alliances are key in our work, and I have to say. For me personally, it has been one of the most fulfilling parts of the work that I get to do uh, at SAGE. Uh, one thing that I would lift up, I made a reference to it earlier, is the, uh, is the Diverse Elders Coalition, which is a national coalition of SAGE and national people of color aging organizations working together um, on a shared group of, of advocacy um, priorities. And we have a whole range of additional 
kinds of partnerships. Some of them are with other, you know, issue-based organizations. So for example, we partner closely with a national organization called Mazon that focuses on hunger and eradicating hunger among Americans and older Americans. That kind of partnership is important. We have an incredible, incredible collection of partners in, uh, in LGBT communities. And so just one example there, we've launched a very exciting partnership with Human Rights Campaign and our two organizations together are advancing something called the Long-Term Care Equality Index that sets standards within the long-term care sector on how to treat our people well and then, and then rates long-term care on how good a job they do. And of course, the corporate sector. Um, we, uh, we have so many different kinds of partners in the corporate sector. They help us reach much larger audiences um, by, you know, we partner with Airbnb, for example, and have been able to do amazing marketing and advertising thanks to their, uh, you know, thanks to their support. Um, we have an extraordinary um, partnership, right, um, now that we'll be announcing in a couple of days, so I guess I'm not supposed to talk about it, but uh, in, in this Pride Month that will that will help support the, the new services that we are developing um, in response to COVID-19. It's, it's all about, from our perspective, it's all about collaborations and partnership. You can do this much on your own and this much um, when you join with others. Michael, um, we're running low on time, but I wanna end our conversation today with a question that I ask all our guests here on Future Proof, uh, and that is one on leadership. Uh, you've touched today on your work dealing with uh, anti-racism, dealing with uh, a pro-aging agenda, talking about your resilience to COVID, and I'm wondering what tips would you have uh, to folks listening or watching about how to be a strong leader, what it takes to be a strong leader during a time of crisis? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, I would say doggedness and persistence. I think we all know these are some exhausting days, right? Um, and, and there can be moments in the morning, I'll speak for myself, when it's like, oh my gosh, I don't wanna get out of bed, right? But but, but we, we, to, to persist, to keep forward, to pushing our, push ourselves. Also to recognize that it's okay to make mistakes and we will make mistakes. We're in a time in COVID, with regard, whether it's COVID-19 or the response of the Black Lives Matter movement and systemic racism where we have to act. Um, you know, we don't have the luxury of, of sitting and analyzing for months trying to create the perfect approaches, right? And, and by, by acting, with urgency, it means that we will sometimes make mistakes. And I think as leaders, we have to give ourself, ourselves the space and the grace to make mistakes and then to learn from them, right? We're in, we're in a, lear a huge learning moment right now. Um, and so I think that that is uh, important as well. And I think one last thing I would say is in the midst of all of this work and challenge, self-care is really important really, really important. You know, there are many different ways to do it there. You know, there's no one strategy, but I would really encourage any of us who are in leadership roles to make sure we figure out how to take care of ourselves, both because we deserve that as human beings and also because we're in this work for the long haul, right? We wanna be doing this work for, not just for weeks or months or even years, but for but, but for decades, so it's a couple of thoughts. Those are, those are terrific thoughts. And I think we could all use a little more self-care these days. Uh, Michael, yes. thank you for your leadership, obviously for your leadership of SAGE mm -hmm. and for being such a champion for LGBT elder issues, but also your, your newfound leadership at ASA. I'm really looking forward to working with you. Uh, and thank day. you for joining us today on Future Proof. All right, thank you, Peter. Bye-bye, you have a good day. Thank you, Michael. And everyone else, please tune in next week uh, where we have another episode of Future Proof and we hope to see you then. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.